Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, come before you into your word, and I pray that you'll use your word today in our hearts and our lives and help us as we, as we uh, look at it, to understand it, to apply it to our lives. Help me as I preach, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, what we read in John chapter 6, Jesus compared himself to, uh, a little bit, to the manna that came from heaven. And uh, he goes a little further than that, and he makes a statement of, one of the I am statements of Christ, he said, I am the bread of life. And he, and he just kind of took that a little bit further, and, he's, and of course, as we read, he said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. Uh, the Jews missed the point at that point. The people who he was speaking to uh, sort of went over their head a little bit, and they began to ask themselves, is he going to make us eat him? What, what is he talking about? We're going to eat his flesh and drink his blood, and that's how you have eternal life. And so they missed the point of what Jesus said. Many of them were offended. Many people today miss the point of what Jesus said when he, when he said, Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood, uh, I, he says, will have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. They missed the point in that they take literally what he meant as a metaphor. Uh, Jesus did not advocate cannibalism as a means of grace to have eternal life. And, and he, he instead spoke of a, a complete trust in Him for eternal life. That was a metaphor for placing your faith and your trust in Christ, in Christ alone. You think about this way. To sustain your physical life, you put your faith and your trust in your food. Do you not? Now, some of us misplace our faith and trust a little bit. We might have misplaced it a little bit over Thanksgiving. I place a lot of faith and trust in pecan pie. Um, but you, you eat something thinking, if I eat this, it's not, one, one, it's not going to kill me, and two, it's going to give me energy to continue functioning as, as a body. And so you trust in your food to sustain physical life. That's what the Israelites did coming out of Egypt in the desert. Manna came from heaven. God gave that to them, and they ate that, and it gave them life temporally. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven, and so you have to eat me. And, of course, that's a metaphor, but he's saying you have to place your trust and your faith in me. Those who miss the point teach that you literally eat the body and blood of Christ in order to be saved. If we believe that this morning, I would have taken the, the whatever that was and held it up, a little square of unleavened bread, and held that up and muttered something in Latin, and that would be a problem because I don't speak Latin, uh, and, and muttered something in Latin, and, and then poof, it would change into the body of Christ, and then when you eat it, you're eating the body of Christ, and that's how you get saved. And the same thing with the cup. And to accommodate that, that teaching, that's what, that's what they do. Um, and it, it may even sound a little si silly or, or even sacred coming whatever background you come from, but it's actually very dangerous because teaching people that eternal life is gained by something that you do is not Christian. In fact, it is, it is anti-Christ to teach people that they have to earn salvation uh, through any means, much less through eating Christ. The spirit and influence of Antichrist is alive today and well. Antichrist is in the world. People talk about when is Antichrist coming, what are the signs, what color is the moon going to turn, and all this kind of stuff. And really, uh, the, the Apostle John said that Antichrist has already come into this world. Maybe not the Antichrist, but the spirit of Antichrist. It appears in many forms, in liberalism, in legalism, in false religion, in Darwinism. It appears in materialism. Antichrist flows through the airwaves to be broadcast on your radio and on your television. It streams over the internet to appear on your computer screen or on your cell phone screen. 
Antichrist appears in the highest levels of government and seeps down to the lowest layer of society. You will encounter the mind and spirit of Antichrist when you go to work, when you go to the store, when you go to the movies, at the ball game, at the school, at the, at the restaurant. You'll rub elbows with, with uh, Antichrist when you turn on your television or radio or computer or phone. You'll encounter Antichrist wherever you go in this world. How can you avoid that influence? If you're surrounded by it, immersed in the culture, how do you avoid the influence of Antichrist? Why do you want to avoid it? Uh, some, you, if you're looking at me and saying, well, I don't want to avoid it, then you've got a bigger problem. But uh, how do you avoid the, uh, how do you go through life and not be influenced by this thinking and this way of life that is anti-Christ. That, by anti-Christ, I don't mean some boogeyman coming to dominate the world. I'm not worried about that. Because when he comes, I'm going to be gone. Amen. Uh, and so I'm not looking for the anti-Christ. I'm looking for Christ to come and call us home. But uh, I'm talking about the spirit of anti-Christ. Jesus wanted his disciples to be on guard against the influence of Antichrist when he came and, 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 and when he uh, was, was discipling them. While he was in Gentile territory, Jesus had healed the daughter of a Canaanite woman, a woman who had great faith because she looked at Jesus and said, I'll take the leftovers, I'll take the table scraps, whatever's left over is enough for me. And he praised her faith and healed her daughter. Then Jesus fed 4,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And then Jesus returned to the region of Galilee, returned to the Jewish people. And it was there, arriving there, Jesus immediately was confronted with the mind and the spirit of Antichrist. He was confronted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This morning I want to speak to you about the need that we have, if you haven't caught on yet, uh, the, the need that we have to avoid this spirit of Antichrist. Uh, we, we are going to uh, talk about how to guard against that Antichrist attitude and not let it seep into our lives. We're going to see Christ confronted by that, see how it affected him. And then we're going to see how the disciples of Christ handled the same spirit when Jesus warned them about it. And looking at these things, I want you to grasp that uh, I want you to grasp the fact that the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well in America this morning, and that it lives closer than you even imagine. I want us to learn how to guard ourselves against the spirit of Antichrist. And so we can learn to effectively serve our Lord and Savior and not fall away. And not fall to a place in sin or in bitterness or in, in our lives where we are no more of use to Him and no more living in His blessing. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 16 with me if you're not there yet. Matthew chapter 16, we'll look at the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 16. And Jesus coming back from Gentile land, from the region of Tyre and Sidon. And the Bible says the Pharisees, in verse 1, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather for... It'll be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees. They reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which, when Jesus perceived, 
He said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand, how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. How do you guard yourself against the spirit of Antichrist? How do you avoid that influence and that evil that seeps in? It's all around us. How do you avoid that? Well, first of all, identify the Antichrist spirit. Identify the Antichrist attitude in, in the, of the world's thinking. You have to identify it. You have to know what it is. You have to figure it out. Identify the world's thinking, how it is Antichrist. In the first four verses, Jesus here um, runs into the Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and the first thing they say is, show us a sign from heaven. They're demanding to see from Jesus some sort of proof that he is the Messiah. And by sign from heaven here, he says here, um, uh, uh, they, said they, they demanded, they tempted, desiring that he would show them a sign from heaven. And what they mean here is not just any sort of miracle. They're not saying, you know, heal a, a, a broken wing on a bird and make him fly again, or, or maybe turn this apple into a plum or something like that. They're not looking for that. They're saying, I want you, they're saying, we want you to perform some kind of miracle in the heavens, some sign, like make the moon turn to blood, or call down fire from heaven, or rearrange the stars in their constellations. If you're really the Messiah, you can do this. They had a motive for their demand. In verse 1, it says they came and tempting. They were tempting him. They were testing him. That was their motive. Not to prove that he was the Messiah, but to disprove that he was the Messiah. That was their motive. They didn't come to him in faith. They came to him in doubt and skepticism. And they were there not to prove that Christ was, was Messiah, but to prove that they were, in fact, right. They didn't believe he could perform such a miracle and that, and, and that not doing so at their demand would prove that Jesus was a phony. Jesus answered not by rearranging the stars or calling down fire from heaven or turning the moon purple or whatever. He didn't answer that way. He answered by exposing them as hypocrites. And, uh, and, and he exposed that they had already refused to believe many signs, and now here they are calling for a sign. That's the, hip the hypocrisy of it. He answered, said to them, verse 2, when, this, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red in the morning. It will be foul weather today, for the sky is low, red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but uh, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? And so they wanted a sign from heaven. They looked to the heavens, Jesus said. You guys look at the sky all the time and you read signs in the sky. Red sky in morning, sailor take warning. Red sky at night, sailors do light. So you guys know that little ditty. And uh, it says you, you can read the signs in the sky, and, uh, but not the signs of the times. So they refused to read the signs Jesus had given to them that he was the Messiah. Jesus had healed all kinds of diseases and, and deformities. Uh, in fact, at their protest, they came to him in the synagogue on the Sabbath day and said, here's a guy, and his hand is withered. I don't know what that means. It just means that it wasn't working right, and it was deformed, and it was messed up. And Jesus said, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand. It was whole, and then they went nuts. They were all mad. You broke the Sabbath because you did that. They didn't believe that sign. Uh, he exercised control over the weather, stepping out on the storm and saying, Peace, be still, and immediately it was. He cast out demons that they could not cast out. He fed thousands with a sack lunch, twice. He caused the blind to see and the lame to walk. He caused the mute to speak. He could raise the dead. He raised up Lazarus from the dead. And what did they do with these signs? 
They said he casts out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. They said he heals on the Sabbath day. He must be of the devil. When, they, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, they plotted to kill him so that the walking evidence would not be there. So Jesus was right when he said, Oh, you hypocrites. They demanded a sign when they had no intention to believe any sign that he performed. They were wicked. They were adulterous. That's their wicked lifestyle, their unfaithfulness to God in the same way as an unfaithful spouse. They were unfaithful to God, yet they claimed to be experts in religion and experts on God. Now it's interesting here that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were united together. Look at verse 12. Um, it says, Then understood they how he had bade them not beware the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. I want you to notice that little word, and. The doctrine singular of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That word, and, translates the Greek word, chi. And basically, that word can only be a word that combines two similar concepts together. It's never, it's a conjunction, and it's never an adversative conjunction. It can never be translated but, or yet, or anything. It has to be and. All right? It has to be uh, complementary things. In other words, these two parties are joined together in agreement on this doctrine. But that doesn't make sense, really, because the Pharisees were the religious conservatives who believed the Old Testament. They believed in angels. They believed in heaven. They believed in hell. These were men who often had to work for a living because they came from a working class. Even Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, was a tent maker because he was not a rich man, uh, even though he was a Pharisee. And these men believed in keeping the law to the letter. The Sadducees were the religious aristocracy and liberals of their time. They rejected most of the New Testament. Uh, they controlled the priesthood in the temple and made a fortune from selling animals in the temple, temple and exchanging money in the temple, ripped people off, um, and they were rich. The Sadducees were, um, they, they denied the existence of angels. They, had di they denied the eternal state of man's soul. They taught that once you die, that's it. There's no eternal life in the teaching of a Sadducee. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees should not be able to get along. They should be diametrically opposed to each other, yet you see this word, chi, this word and, they're tied together by one thing. What is the one doctrine that unites them? anti Christ. The one thing that they could agree on, the thing that brought them together was their opposition to Jesus. Antichrist is that one doctrine. It, it opposes Christ because it is wicked and unfaithful to God. That's what they were. That's why he drove them nuts. That's why he bothered them so much. They were wicked and unfaithful, and Christ exposes that wickedness and unfaithfulness. Rather than repent, though, the world seeks to silence Christ and justify their sin, which is what the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees would do. Why is that? Why does the world seek just to justify themselves and silence Christ? Well, that's the major tenet of Antichrist. It's a laser focus on this world. It's a laser focus. It is a fixation on the present, the here and the now. The worldly mindedness is the marker, the one thing that marks Antichrist. The mindset of Antichrist is the mindset of the here and now, the, the mindset of focusing on this world and nothing more. The things of this world take priority to the mind of Antichrist. Pharisees had a lot of prestige in this world. They were the religious gurus. They had great followings. They had fame. They had uh, a good living. They had uh, 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 esteem of men. The Sadducees had a lot of power and a lot of wealth in this world. And that's what they lived for. 
And if Christ was the Messiah, they stood to lose most of that, if not all of it. So it didn't matter what sign he performed. It, they, they didn't ever plan to believe in him because they didn't want to let go of this world that they gripped so tightly. If Jesus had called down fire from heaven, turned the moon to blood, or rearranged the stars in heaven, or sent a comet shooting across the sky, they would not have believed him. You say, how can you be so sure? I mean, it's pretty convincing. If a guy came to Moequa and said, all right, we're going to have an, e we're gonna have an evening service, and we're going to go outside, and he goes outside, and he says, you see the moon? And you say, yeah, there's a full moon out. He points at the moon, it turns red. Be creepy, wouldn't it? He says, that's... That's not all. He points at the moon. He goes like this. And the moon follows him all the way across the sky to the other end of the sky. And he said, good night. That, that would be convincing. He says, you see that constellation? There's Orion up there. I'm going to give him another sword. Watch this. You guys know that Orion has a sword, right? Okay. And, and if he's doing all this stuff, he says, we're going to finish this off with a barbecue. And he's got, he's got a, a barbecue grill out. He's got meat laid on it, and he just calls down fire from heaven and, and cooks that meat. Would you be convinced that this man just might possibly be the Messiah? <laughs> well, that would be pretty interesting. That would be pretty powerful as far as signs go. You say, if he did that for them, wouldn't they believe? Well, no. You say, how do you know they wouldn't believe? Well, verse 4, Jesus says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it unto it, but except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonas, who's Jonah, and he left them and departed. Now, the sign of Jonah is this. Jonah, obviously the prophet who was swallowed by a great fish or a whale, if you would, and people have said, you know, a man can't live in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. That may be true. Jonah may have died. But he came out alive. That's the point. And he was buried three days and three nights in a whale or a fish or something. And that thing spits him up on dry land and he goes and preaches. The point is he went down. He was three days gone under, and he came out alive, and Jesus says, that is the sign that I'm going to give you. When did they get that sign? Listen to Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. The soldiers are coming back from the tomb. They've just witnessed the resurrection of Christ. An angel has rolled back the stone, and Jesus walked out alive, and he's gone, and the soldiers come back to the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders. And listen to what happens here. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. Isn't that amazing? Jesus told them in advance, I am going to die and I'm going to rise from the dead. That's why they sent soldiers in front of his grave. They said, he claims he's going to rise from the dead. Well, we're going to prove that wrong because we're going to put a guard in front of his grave for three days and three nights. Then Jesus rises from the dead, even though there's a guard there, and the soldiers come back and say, guess what? Jesus just rose from the dead. And they say, here, take some money. Visa, MasterCard, you can take it all. Take all this money and say it was a trick. They know. Jesus rose from the dead. They heard him predict it, and yet they will not believe. They refuse. They even covered it up. Why? Because they are focused on this world. They are, they are ever worldly minded, and that is the spirit of Antichrist. They don't want to lose all that they have so that Jesus can rule over them. 
Now you need also, and I need to beware in identify worldly mindedness. It's antichrist. Worldly mindedness is a focus on pleasure rather than purity. Worldly, worldly mind is, is a, a focus on material things rather than on eternal things. It is a focus on prestige and, and reputation rather than on the truth of Christ and the gospel. It all comes down to one thing. It comes down to priority. What has ultimate priority in your life? Are the things of this world or things of the next world? Uh, a week ago, I ran a half marathon. I, I didn't even finish close to the guy who won it. I mean, before the race, I had visions of grandeur dan dancing through my head of, of how high I was going to finish in the race, and I was going to take hardware home. That was my goal. And uh, I did get a medal for finishing, but that's not what I was going for. And uh, it was snowing. It was about 25 degrees. And the wind was unbelievably hard in our face, about 25, 30 miles an hour. The man who won the race ran 13 miles in those conditions at a pace of 6 minutes and 49 seconds per mile. For 13 miles, with a headwind, snow, it was nasty out there. He was my age. I wanted to say, he was younger than me. No, he was in my age division. So was the guy who finished second. Uh, and, uh, and the guy who finished third was, I think, in his 50s. You know what it was? Priority. All right? Those guys made running much more of a priority than I did. He gave more time to it. He endured much more than I did. And on race day, his priority was not his comfort. His priority was not, can I live? His priority was, I am going to win this race. He was there to win. He wasn't there to finish. There was a lot of people that were there to finish. I was there to win for the first seven miles. I was there to finish for the last six. You see the difference? And he was there to win through the whole thing. That's what a priority is. All right. What is a priority? It's something you give much time to. It occupies your life. So what is your priority? What occupies your life today? What are the priorities? Are there things that, are, that have set your affection above or are they things here on the earth? Identify the antichrist attitude of the world's thinking. That is worldly mindedness. Look at your priorities. Now that we've identified the antichrist attitude, what should we do with this information? How, how does this affect us? Well, if we identify it, there's one thing we can do for sure, and that is this. Refuse to allow that thinking to guide your heart. Refuse to allow worldly mindedness to be your guide, to be what drives your decisions, to be what sets your priorities. Refuse to allow that thinking to guide your heart. In verse 5, Jesus, he gets on the boat and rides across the sea again. They're going somewhere else with his disciples. Um, and they forgot to take bread. In verse 5, and when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. In verse 12, we found out that that leaven was not bread, it was doctrine. And now the disciples here are, they're unloading the boat. They're on the other side now, they've gone across. They're unloading the boat, basket after basket, and they get out the food basket, and they look in, and there's one loaf of stinking bread in there for all 13 of them. Mark chapter 8, verse 14 says they had one loaf left, and they're looking around and said, all right, you know, you know you do this, guys, when you go somewhere and you forget something, and you look at each other. And say, you forgot. No, you forgot. You didn't remind me. Well, you didn't remind me to remind you. And uh, you don't do that? Okay. Um, nobody does that. Um, anyway. Um, and so they're looking around. And then, Who forgot the bread? And Jesus overhears this. And this is what Jesus does. He takes everyday conversation. He always turns it into something uh, of a teaching moment. And so... Um, he hears them talking about that, and, and, and he says, and perhaps he sat silently in the boat all the way across, kind of stewing over this 
encounter that he's had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's not in a good mood, I don't think. And Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He leaves it at that, thinking they'll, they'll get this. Now, leaven in those days was the only way, the only way to make leavened bread was to take some leavened bread and put it in your unleavened bread. So they always keep a little bit, like a, like a starter pack around, take a little bit out, throw it in the new dough, and it would leaven the whole thing. And because of that, just a little bit could leaven a whole lump of bread. Because of that, leaven, in, uh, leaven represents influence in the Bible, whether good or bad. Usually bad, but not always. And so Jesus is saying, using leaven as a metaphor, Jesus is saying to his disciples, watch out for the influence of the scribes and Pharisees' doctrine. Watch out for how it permeates society and don't let it affect you. And he was saying, don't allow their teaching and thinking to influence you. It was a warning. In fact, you read this passage, that is the major thrust of this passage. Watch out for the leaven. Watch out for the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why did he warn them? Because they needed warning. All right? Jesus doesn't just say stuff to say stuff. He doesn't waste words. We're pretty good at wasting words. You say, preacher, you're really good at wasting words. Uh, and and uh, uh, Jesus didn't, didn't mince words, didn't waste words. He warned them because they needed warning. They were, they were affected. One time Jesus was teaching and they say, came to Jesus and said, don't you know you've offended the Pharisees? And Jesus said, big deal. <laughs> they were still under a little bit under the influence of these people. This morning, Jesus says to all of us, don't allow the thinking of this world to influence and to guide you. Refuse the direction. Refuse the influence of Antichrist. That's what he's telling us. Why does the church so often look like the world? Why is that? Uh, that Christians look like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world, act like the world, laugh at what the world laughs at, fear what the world fears, subscribe to the world's standard of morality, uh, um, follow the world's goals, and use the world's measure of success as our measure of success. Why do we do that? Why, why do Christians look like the world? It's because the thinking of Christians in the church is so often guided by that world's influence. And so let's refuse to allow the spirit of Antichrist to guide us, to guide our hearts. What does the song say? The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. It's a little repetitive, isn't it? The world behind me, the cross before me. But it's on purpose. No turning back. No turning back. Why does that happen? Because I've decided to follow Jesus. You know that? And until you refuse to let the world's thinking guide you, you haven't really decided to follow Jesus. Or you may be a Christian, but you're living a weak Christian life. Refuse the world's influence. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples and telling us. You need to identify in a Christ. Worldly mindedness is antichrist. Refuse to allow that thinking to influence and guide you. How can you do that? There's one great principle that will help us to refuse the world's guidance and follow Christ. And that is this. Let heaven be your greatest influence. Let, let the next world be the world you live for. As the Apostle Paul said, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. In verse 6, the disciples had missed his point. He said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. They totally missed it. They took Jesus very literally. Uh, sometimes if you take Jesus literally, you get problems. You get people trying to be cannibals when taking communion. Uh, you, get, you, you get people uh, uh, getting all mixed up about things, and, and they were mixed up. And they should have known better. Why, why should they have known better? Well, because of what Jesus just did. He said, look, if it was about bread, don't you think I could feed us? I mean, we got a loaf here. And don't you, I fed 5,000. I fed 4,000. You think I can't feed 13? Uh, that's, that's what he's saying. This is why Jesus would say to them, O ye of little faith. 
Because they were so occupied with little things. You know, little faith is occupied with little things. The things of this world. That's what little faith is fixed on. Lord, give me more stuff. Lord, bless me with more things. Uh, Lord, make it work my way. And that's what little faith prays for all the time. Doesn't mean you can't pray for those things, but that's the fixed focus, the laser focus of little faith. That's what they were occupied with, the little things. And there was something much larger going on. But big faith sees the larger picture. Jesus' disciples here were focused on the world and worldly things. So Jesus seeks to refocus them here on eternal things. To make the, to, to make the world to come more of an influence on them than their everyday lives in this world. Now that would be a process. In fact, a little while later here, Jesus is going to predict his death and Peter doesn't take it so well. Verse 21 of chapter 16, uh, From that time forth Jesus began to show his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Look what Peter says, verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And see, it's a process here, because Jesus said, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried and rise from the dead. And all Peter heard was Jesus was going to die. That's, he, he was done listening at that point. And he says, no, Lord, this can't happen to you. You're the Messiah. He's totally missed the point because these guys were thinking, we're going to rule and reign now. Jesus is going to sit on the throne. They're thinking about this world. Jesus begins here the process of refocusing them on the next world to let heaven be their greatest influence. And that would happen. Let me ask you this. How much does eternity influence your everyday life? How much does it influence the way you speak? The way you treat others, the way you invest your money, uh, the, the way you plan your week and how you spend your time or the people you hang out with. How much does eternity influence those decisions? Let me, uh, let me give you the key. The key is this, let heaven be your greatest influence. That way when we've identified worldly mindedness, as Antichrist, and we say, I refuse to allow that to guide me. The key to refusing that and following Christ is letting heaven be your guide. The thing that influences you the most. How can you do that? Pray for it. Pray, pray that way. Lord, help me focus on heaven. By the way, if you pray for that, expect him to do the work. Spend time daily in the word of God. Re-examine your goals in life. You ought, to have a, you ought to have a devotional time. You say, I come to church and I hear preaching and that's good enough for me. You ought to spend time every day with the Lord. You say, I love Jesus. Never talk to him though. Really? How's that work when you were dating? Uh, you say, I, 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 I love Jesus. I'm going to spend no time with him. I don't care what he says. I don't know about that. Re-examine your goals in life and take inventory of your speech. You know, you'll talk about what you love. Some of you are, some of you are Cardinals fans. And you'll come in here on a Wednesday night when, they're, when the Cardinals are playing and say, they're playing at 7, let's hurry it up. And, uh, you, you know, and, and uh, I, I can be on the same track sometimes and, and whatever I'm, I'm really into for the time being, I really talk it up because I'm interested. Take inventory of your speech. What do you talk about? What's the most interesting thing for you to talk about? One major factor that will change everything, Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's pray and they'll come with the invitation here.